Um, okay, so in my talk today, I will talk about communication and timing issues with MPI virtualization. And let me first talk about what I mean with MPI virtualization. So um, what I mean by that is our standard model when we use MPI is to have at most one process per core, right? So we have here four MP, uh, three MPI processes, each of them is using one core. In practice, a lot of people actually don't even do that, but um, it's one MPI process per node. And then as we heard before, it's this MPI plus X model, where then we actually use the multiple cores, for example, with OpenMP or something like that. Um, of course, this works. Um, but this has certain drawbacks or certain things that we cannot do in this model as we will see later. And what we propose is something that looks more like that. So we have a CPU core and then we have multiple MPI processes. So at this point, I don't want to call them processes anymore because processes always sounds like their own address space and so on, but multiple ranks in MPI com world, let's say, um, that share this one core. So what we can do now is we can switch between the MPI processes or MPI ranks that are executed based on what they are doing. So if we see that an MPI process is entering MPI weight, then it makes no sense to give the CPU core to this rank, but we could rather switch to a different rank, which is currently computing. And in this way, we can easily overlap communication and computation without the user doing something special, right? So we don't even need to use non-blocking communication here in order to do this. And so that was one strong point that we, we saw for MPI virtualization. So for this idea of oversubscribing, the other one is load balancing. So if we have, again, this traditional example of um, three MPI processes, and they all want to receive some data from each other, let's say in a ring, then unless this compute function takes exactly the same amount of time on each of the cores, somebody will have will be the slowest core and will make all the other cores or some other cores wait for him. And of course, this can be alleviated again with non-blocking communication, but we see that this makes the code much more complex. So if we have a code like here on the left side where we simply have an MPI receive, then while the NIC is working, receiving this data, we don't do anything and then later we can compute something again. So now as MPI experts, you will say, well, this is just the naive way to do it. The right way to do it is to use MPI I receive. Then you start your, your uh, computation and then you regularly call MPI test. And at some point you call MPI wait just before you actually need the data for the next instruction. And this significantly complicates your code and um, especially if it's not just MPI I receive and wait, but you want to sprinkle some test MPI test calls there um, at the right um, intervals. And these intervals depends on your hardware and on your network load and so on and so on. So doing this correctly, not in the sense of, of actual correctness, but in the sense of maximal, maximizing performance is actually very, very difficult. And again, MPI virtualization can greatly help with this because there the blocking code can achieve this full overlap as we will see later. Um, so this MPI virtualization, as you might know, is not a new idea. This has been proposed in many, many papers. I'm terribly sorry for all the authors of virtualized um, MPI implementations that are not mentioned here. So this doesn't mean this doesn't exist. It just means that um, it's maybe not on this slide. I think the literature survey in the paper is also more expensive, uh, more extensive. But the idea that we that we follow is very similar to adaptive MPI. And the idea is that we have to minimize the switching cost between different MPI processes. So um, if we actually use 
OS processes, then the switching time is too large uh, for this to, to work well. So what we want to make is we want to turn MPI processes into something that looks like a function call. So has very small switching overhead. There is no context switch when switching between MPI processes. Our actual implementation is close to something called Grappa. So there was already some code that uh, also followed this, uh, this concept. And also our implementation is freely available. So if you want to look at how this works, you can and take a look here. So what are actually these switching costs? So this uh, project was done um, in the within the Moblaw project. So we implemented this not only for x86, but for ARM as well. And what we see is that we can switch between MPI processes now um, in less than 10 nanoseconds for a large number of tasks on x86. Um, and in around uh, 20 to 30 nanoseconds on ARM. And what you see here is shown in different colors. So on the x-axis, we just vary the number of tasks that are running concurrently. On the y-axis, we see, of course, the time. So lower is better here. And they, you have annotations, no prefetch, prefetch one and prefetch two. What this means is different strategies for prefetching tasks. So we always know what should be the next task that we want to switch to, of course, and we can pre prefetch uh, <laughs> using uh, prefetch instructions some of the cache lines that this task will need. And we see that for um, x86, this gives a clear benefit, uh, gives gives no benefit, sorry, over the no prefetch um, idea. And then you could say, well, we can even prefetch more data with the, uh, and basically the next task and the next, next task already. But also this doesn't really give us any benefit. So we evaluated that, but basically the, the best idea is to just switch as fast as possible without adding additional instructions for prefetching. Okay, so now we have this implementation that really gives us a low, sorry, yeah, that gives us this low switching overhead, but can, does it actually achieve what I, what I promised? So before we said what we want is this um, full overlap, even though we use blocking code, not a uh, non-blocking one with the correct number or interval of MPI tests sprinkled in. And to this end, we uh, wrote some benchmarks. So this is a stencil. And what we vary in this stencil is the message size, we, um, but the number of neighbors always stays the same. So we just vary the size of the halo. And the computation in this stencil also stays the same. So imagine this as, for example, a 2D stencil and then you change the thickness of the halo region that you um, exchange. So on the x-axis, we are actually just varying this halo size. On the y-axis, we see the execution time. And as I said, the computation that is done in this stencil is always the same. So you have this uh, horizontal blue line that is t-comp, so time for the computation, and this is constant throughout the experiment. Now we can measure how long the communication takes for the specific message size, right? So this is t-com. And what we can now say is that if we have no overlap, then we can just add t-com to t-com, and we will arrive at this uh, pink line at the top that is just these two added together. And we can measure how much our implementation takes um, where we try to get full overlap. And we see that this green line, this is the, the actual reason for this experiment. This is how long our code runs with our MPI implementation. And this is somewhere between the, the minimum, so this T comp, right? If we would have full overlap, then we would be on this blue line somewhere and constant, or the worst case, which is no overlap. 
if we use a virtualization ratio of two. So what does this mean, a virtualization ratio of two? This means that per core, per physical core, we actually just have two of our MPI, virtual MPI processes. So what happens if we increase this to a virtualization ratio of three? So then we say we see that actually we achieve this full overlap. So now this T full line lies perfectly flat on the line for the computation. So this is very good. And of course, this begs the question, why is this the case? Why, why does this change so much if we increase this virtualization ratio? And the answer is simple. So uh, maybe it's not simple. It's just simple once you know it. So basically, what we want to achieve is full overlap. So we uh, implemented our own rendezvous protocol. We implemented this on IB verbs or on top of IB verbs so that we really con can control when the NIC is waiting for something and when, when data processing can happen and so on. Um, so we use the standard rendezvous protocol. And as you can see here on the left, if you have only two tasks, then there can be this period where you just have nothing to do. So you need a third task to fill this period because you have the initiation on both sides and then on the sender side, the re-entry and then later the completion with the, with the X. So you have kind of three different points uh, where you could be waiting for something as a sender. But if you have only two tasks, then this doesn't work to overlap everything. So as soon as you add a third task, you can fill this um, this diagram completely so that at least one of these uh, three tasks is not waiting at any point. And so that's why we get this much better overlap for V is equal or virtualization ratio equal to three or more. So if we add more than this, is slightly detrimental, of course, because at some point you pay more for your switching overhead, um, but it doesn't deteriorate that much. So it's okay, it just shouldn't be less than two. Okay, but now we discovered a problem with this when we actually started running micro benchmarks. So here we ran HPC CG, and as you can see, um, we got a very, very uh, bad number for the mega flops. And we were wondering, okay, maybe our implementation is bad. Let's try with another virtualized MPI implementation that is out there. So we used MPC, M sorry, MPC MPI. We did the same benchmark and we got an even worse uh, number. So that was already nice. We are already better than some competition, but um, didn't really help us uh, to, to understand what was going on until we looked at this in a bit more detail and how the benchmark was written. And it turns out it just uses MPIW time to measure the time that it had to compute. And then if you have a virtualized MPI implementation like our one or a lot of the others out there that I mentioned before, then you have these gaps that you see here. So Basically, uh, on the top of this diagram, you see the situation that we had with this with this micro benchmark, right? So we have two MPI processes that share the same core, so they can never be active at the same time. So they are kind of interleaved, and then at some point, each of them starts taking the the starting time, and we basically count the time twice for both of them. And that's why we propose to introduce new timers. So we think we need a rank point of view and a core point of view measurement instead of just MPIW time. And that would allow benchmarks to use these timers correctly and say, okay, I want to really have the work log time or no, I want to have the time I was actually running. Um, or I want to say something about how long this core, the, some specific core was busy. And how can, be, how can those be implemented? Well, this is quite simple. So in the top right, we have the state diagram of, the, of our processes. So this should be obvious for everybody that um, has seen some OS class before. So it, it's a simple state diagram. We have states either in a running state or in a sleeping state um, or suspended state. 
or they are initialized or finalized, right? So these, these don't even uh, occur that much, just once in the lifetime of this process. And now on each of these events, we can update the timer variable. So I think the, the code itself is fairly obvious how this needs to be updated. The interesting thing here is that this is only a few instructions for each of these events. And this is important because we want this to be fast. So um, if we need to do a lot of bookkeeping now in addition, then these timers would be very costly to implement. So we checked how long it um, how long it takes now to do a suspend or resume with these timers added. And as you might remember from before, this was around 10 nanoseconds, and now we are in the median. So this is a, a cumulative distribution function of this experiment. So basically, um, as you can see here, 50% of the, of the measurements, the overhead was uh, uh, 35 nanoseconds for resume and 38 nanoseconds for the suspend. And of course, this has a long tail because there's always uh, some event that, that can really interrupt you, uh, kind of outliers. But you see that the 99th percentile already is, um, is quite low. So yeah, that uh, that indicates that actually the cost of these timers wouldn't be too high, so they can really be implemented, and they are actually only needed if we know that um, we take measurements in the next or in this part of the code that we are transitioning to. So since most of these adaptive MPI solutions anyway need some sort of compiler support to eliminate global variables, this could also be checked there and lead to further savings. So you wouldn't pay the additional overhead for the for the timer actualization every time you switch. But we didn't investigate how much um, in practical codes, how much this would save. So here we are basically giving you the, the worst case estimation that, okay, this uh, can add 20 nanoseconds to your switching time. Okay, so this concludes my presentation. So, we have seen that MPI virtualization helps to make poorly written codes perform well. Uh, in my opinion, this is not a new observation. This was the motivation for many, many virtualized MPI projects that already exist. Um, what we really found, in my opinion, is that choosing the right factor of oversubscription is important but depends on the environment. And you really need to control this environment to give precise answers what this should be. So you cannot be based on some high level communication substrate, but really intercept at the NIC level. So that's why we implemented everything uh, on top of IB verbs. Um, and the MPI timing infrastructure is actually a poor match for virtualized MPI environments. This was my main takeaway for this project. So there are so many uh, virtualized MPI implementations already out there but we don't have the timing infrastructure to actually support them well. So that's why I wanted to give this talk at this conference as maybe uh, a point for the people that make the MPI standard to think about, okay, maybe something like this could be added. And we propose something that works well in practice, in my opinion, it adds only 30 nanoseconds of switching overhead. So. Okay, with that, I'm ready for your questions and thanks for your attention. Okay, are there are there any questions uh, from the audience? We have time for one since we're basically back on schedule. Any, I don't see any questions. Um, okay, I guess since we're, since we're late, let's go on to the to the next next presentation. Okay, Thank you. Can you hear me, Rich? Yes. It looks like someone's typing a question in the Slack channel. If you, um, mm. when possibly, okay, I, will, I can copy it I'm over there sure in a I'm second. Gonna, yeah, that I'm would be good. Right, and then try to go to the Slack. Okay, I'll copy it into the chat for you, Rich. It is um, 
well, okay, I guess I can just say the question. That was interesting work on overlap and oversubscribing. Did you observe uh, reduced compute time due to the oversubscription? Yes, we observed this in uh, some benchmarks. So in some benchmarks, you also have caching effects due to over, not necessarily only to oversubscription, but basically um, if, the, if the code itself is written poorly, so that it's not cache oblivious basically. And then by oversubscribing, you see you hit the right kind of decomposition, then you can actually get an additional benefit due to cache effects. But it, this doesn't generalize. So it, it's not that, okay, if, if for any code this happens, it's just that if your access pattern is just right and then it matches with the decomposition that you wouldn't have if you don't oversubscribe on this on on this machine. Does this answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, so thanks.